Good evening, everyone. My name is Pauline McIntosh, and on behalf of St. Francis Xavier University, I'd like to welcome you to the Topshi Memorial Webinar Series. St. Effects University and the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour acknowledge that we work in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the Treaties of Peace and Friendship, which the Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British Crown in 1725. The treaties did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, but in fact, recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between the nations. We strive for respectful partnerships with all peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation. We also recognize that Nova Scotia is home to over 50 African Nova Scotian communities whose culture, heritage, and histories have been and remain a key part of this province for more than 400 years. For generations, people of African descent have experienced inequities due to systemic racism in Nova Scotia and still do today. We strive to listen to and learn from the first voice perspectives of Black Nova Scotians, amplify, amplify Black voices, support Black communities, and address inequities and injustices in our work together. Before we proceed, please know that tonight's webinar will be recorded and shared with others on the organizers' websites. The Topshi Memorial webinar series is sponsored by the Topshi Memorial Fund, which was established in 1984 to honor the memory of Reverend George Topshi. Topshi was the director of the St. Evax Extension Department from 1969 until 1982, and of the Cody Institute from 1973 to 1979. He worked to maintain close links to organized labor, cooperators, and credit unions. Topshi saw workers in their trade unions and consumers and producers in their cooperatives and credit unions as part of the same cause for social justice and economic democracy. I will now call upon Danny Cavanaugh, president of the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor, to bring greetings on behalf of the Federation. Danny? Yeah, thanks, Pauline. Uh, the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour proudly represents the rights and interests of over 70,000 hardworking United workers from 135 union locals across the province. Our history as a federation is firmly rooted in social justice and economic security principles which we continue to strive for through our ongoing campaigns, initiatives, and work to change laws and regulations. We're also committed to advocating for all workers' rights and ensuring everyone can access fair and equitable working conditions, wages, and benefits. And Pauline, I'd like to thank you for uh, hosting tonight's um, webinar and Thanks to uh, St. of X and the Cody Institute for uh, the use of their webinar services, including Brian and some of the folks in the background to make these webinars work. And also a special thanks to each of our guests tonight. Um, I hope everyone gets to learn a little bit about um, folks from our Black community and some of the some of the issues they faced over time. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to welcome everybody and um, and uh, let's get it started and see what we can learn from each other this evening. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Danny. And I, I'll, I'm happy to say that we're always very, very pleased to partner with the Nova Scotia Federation of Labour. I think this is the sixth or seventh webinar that we've done together. And it's truly been a great experience and has provided a really nice forum for us to bring folks together from across the province and talk about really important issues of the day. And before we get started uh, hearing from our panelists this evening, which I'm very excited about, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the webinar process itself. So each of our three speakers will have seven minutes to, to present, and I'll ask you, the audience, to type any questions or comments that you may have into chat. And once all of our speakers have presented, uh, we'll have a little bit of time, probably 15 minutes or so, where we can uh, share your questions or comments with the speakers, and we'll take it from there. 
And with that, I would like to welcome our three panelists. We have Russell Gross, Executive Director of the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia, Rocky Beals from the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor, Vice President representing workers of color and Aboriginal people, and Jason McLean, Secretary Treasurer of the National Union of Public and General Employees. And Russell is going to be our first speaker this evening. Russell has been involved in the protection, preservation, and promotion of Nova Scotia's Black culture and history for over 28 years. He has been an employee of the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia since 1994, starting off as a summer student and holding various development and supervisory roles, including operations manager, project manager, assistant director, and in December 2013, Russell was appointed to the role of executive director, which he currently holds. A native of the historic Nova Scotia multi-generational Black community of Cherry Brook, Russell comes from a large family that truly believes in the importance of serving the community. Welcome, Russell. Thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction and uh, summary of of who I am. I'm so glad to be here tonight and uh, be with you all uh, for this important um, reflection on an important month. You know, as we know, February is African Heritage Month, also known as Black History Month in other provinces, and uh, an important time to reflect and to uh, celebrate the contributions of people of color. And you know, when we look at this, you know, it, it basically is Black History Month 365 days of the year. But February gives us an opportunity to celebrate and to um, educate uh, on the important role of uh, our black uh, communities and black contributions. I am the executive director of the Black Cultural Center for Nova Scotia. And uh, Nova Scotia has a powerful black history and a longstanding black history that stretches back well over 400 years. Nova Scotia is known as the birthplace of black culture and heritage in Canada because we have the oldest and largest black communities that are multi-generational. Uh, in my particular family, I can trace my, my family lineage back over seven generations. So that creates a remarkable history and a remarkable legacy. What I'd like to do is to share with you a brief presentation that outlines the history of blacks in Nova Scotia and the four major migrations of blacks as they entered into this province. The history of African Nova Scotians reaches back to the early founding years of the province of Nova Scotia. Many of today's communities can trace their origins to centuries ago, when Nova Scotia held a promise of a better life for people of African descent. Explorer Matthew da Costa is credited as being the first to arrive as part of an expedition that founded Port Royal in 1605. In the 1700s, small populations of French and English black settlers were part of colonial towns such as Lewisburg and early Halifax. The first large group of migrants were the black loyalists, who came as refugees after the American Revolution between 1782 and 1785. Roughly about 3,500 people settled throughout Nova Scotia. They were blacks in the American colonies who opted to side with the British during the United States War for Independence because the British offered protection, freedom, land rations in return for support. Other blacks would come to Nova Scotia in the 1780s as the property of white loyalists. Some were slaves, others were indentured servants, though there wasn't much difference between the two categories. When the war ended in 1783, New York was the last British-held port. It became the departure point for thousands of loyalists, black and white. British officials drew a detailed list of the blacks who were leaving. This list, known as the Book of Negroes, stated whether a person was free, a slave, or an indentured servant, and what their military service had been. When the black loyalists arrived in Nova Scotia, roughly half, approximately 1,521 men, women, and children, settled in Birchtown near Shelburne. Birchtown became an instant town, the largest settlement of free blacks in the world outside of Africa. They received a percentage of the free land and rations as they had been promised, though their land was far from the best. The other 1,500 or so free blacks who came to Nova Scotia settled elsewhere. In communities such as Annapolis Royal, 
Clemens, Granville, Brindley Town, Preston, Trackety, Shadabacto, Halifax, and parts of what is now known as New Brunswick. Disappointed by the failure of the British to honor their promises, especially regarding land and equal status, many black loyalists began to wonder if Nova Scotia was where they wanted to be. A new destination across the ocean in Africa called out to many. In 1792, many black loyalists made an exodus to Africa. Over 1,000 men, women, and children left Halifax on 15 ships for the long voyage to Sierra Leone. Some died en route. Today, the Nova Scotia influence can still be found in Sierra Leone. Just as the end of the American Revolution brought the black loyalists to Nova Scotia, so the end of the next major war brought a different group of black settlers to the province. The second group came from Jamaica. They were known as the Trelawney Maroons, after the town from which they came. The Maroons were a determined group of freedom fighters from Jamaica. For nearly a century and a half, beginning in the 1650s, they waged an intermittent war with the British administration of the island. They wanted independence. In 1795, the administration in Jamaica decided to remove the Maroons. Three ships brought 543 men, women, and children to Halifax in late June of 1796. The commander-in-chief of the British at Halifax was Edward Augustus, Duke of Kent, later the father of Queen Victoria. He was pleased to see the Maroons join Nova Scotia militia units and had them work on building projects such as the 3rd Halifax Citadel and Government House. Most of the Maroons, like nearly half of the black loyalists a few years earlier, began to wonder if Nova Scotia was a good choice for their new home. In 1799, many Maroons migrated to Sierra Leone. Those that remained settled in communities such as Boydville in Sackville area and the township of Preston. The War of 1812 between the United States and Britain resulted in another era of significant migration. Roughly 2,000 black refugees from the Chesapeake Bay area of Virginia and from Georgia seeking freedom arrived in Nova Scotia between 1813 and 1816. Many settled in Halifax and Dartmouth, including two large groups in Upper Hammonds Plains and Preston. Others went to smaller communities around the province, such as Covequit Road in Lower Sackville, Five Mile Plains, Beach Hill, later known as Beachville, Porter's Lake, Fletcher's Lake, Prospect Road, Beaver Bank, Avonport, Pine Woods, Picto, Mill Village, and Campbell Road, later known as the community of Africville. The early 1900s saw the last historic group of black settlers arrive in Nova Scotia as hundreds of Caribbean migrants, known as later arrivals, came to Cape Breton to work in the steel and coal mines. With a history that spans more than 400 years, African Nova Scotians have a rich legacy in this province. Strong communities established long ago continue to this day. The achievements and triumphs that those ancestors endured is a source of great inspiration and pride for all African Nova Scotians. Through the spirit of unity, African Nova Scotians are a part of the diverse fabric that weaves the life of Canada. So I hope you enjoyed that brief presentation about uh, Nova Scotia's black history. And I urge you, uh, you know, that if you're in the Metro Halifax area to visit the Black Cultural Center, you're always welcome to come there. This year, we're celebrating our 40th year of operation. So we've been uh, around for a bit and we have lots of great history and stories to share. And of course, visit our website uh, to find out more information uh, and, and take part in the virtual tour. So. Once again, so glad to be here, and I hope that that was a good, uh, quick, brief overview of uh, African Nova Scotia history and, and how it uh, appeals to the fabric of what we call Canada today. Thanks so much, Russell. That was an amazing presentation. It gave us such a, a rich and deep overview of the, the history of Black people in our province. I'm sure that you're going to get many more people coming into the center now uh, to learn more uh, from the resources that are available there. Uh, thank you so much and look forward to hearing more from you when we get to the question and answer part of the evening. Great. Our next speaker this evening is Rocky Beals. Rocky is currently the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor Vice President representing workers of color and Aboriginal people and serves on the Board of Directors for Nova Scotia Government uh, and General Employees Union, the NSGEU. Rocky aspires to promote awareness of the many struggles facing equity-deserving workers 
and strives to contribute to improving their working lives and thus their home lives. She has been a workers, right, workers' rights activist for over 30 years and has labored to advance the human rights of workers in her workplace and her local, which has led to contributions at both provincial and national levels. In the future, Rocky hopes to use her perpetually packed carry-on bag to continue her lifelong passion of travel. Welcome, Rocky. Thank you. And uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I have a slightly different spin than Russell. Um, I have, uh, I'm gonna be looking away from the camera for a little bit because I have um, notes here that I'm gonna be following. But uh, I just wanna talk a little bit about um, African Nova Scotian workers and their relationship to their union and how their unions have helped to enrich their lives over the years. So uh, these are just my observations and my observations come from my leadership positions. I've had a few leadership positions over the years and so that's where I'm coming from. Uh, let's start with collective agreements. And just, just over the last while, I've noted that in terms of uh, collective agreements, that there have been strides with unions to, um, to make the clauses more equal for, for workers. And the, uh, some of the clauses are written to reflect some of the unique cultural, cultural experience of workers. That's just one of the examples that I've noted. And um, I, just I just find it very interesting that now language is, is, a, is an issue where many workers are not necessarily born in Canada speaking with English as their first language, that um, unions are trying to find ways to incorporate and how to communicate with members over their collective agreement rights with, uh, I don't know, it, it's just interesting. And I thought I'd mention that today. Another, um, another strive is in servicing or policing that, that particular collective agreement. I've noticed a uh, more, more over the last five or six years um, where, the, where unions are trying to become diverse in their staffing, they're becoming, and with that, they're more diverse and more inclusive in terms of how, how the members are serviced is servicing um, meeting the needs of the members? Are they communicating well with members? And I've noticed that that is something that actually has moved, like there was a big change in that, particularly over the last 10 years. Another, um, another uh, is the engagement of African Nova Scotian workers with their union, how, how often and how often they participate. And I've seen even that is starting to, to pick up again. There seemed to be a little bit more engagement maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it dropped off, but now I've noticed that that's picking back up again. And I attribute some of that to, um, to uh, some of the social events that um, some of the unions are starting to hold and to a lot of the social justice work that unions are doing, because many unions do social justice work, not just um, within the local and at strike time, but they do that also provincially, for example, with Fiona and even internationally where um, some unions uh, donate when, for example, the, uh, the earthquake with Turkey and Syria. So I've seen some of that happening too. Another area of improvement is messaging, messaging to members and messaging about members. So now um, unions tend to, their messaging tends to be a bit more consistent. It's uh, often more targeted. I don't know if everybody notices this, but 
like I said, from my leadership position, I'm starting to notice some of these things. And also that the um, messaging may be, uh, I, I don't know what the exact term is, we want to say it's, it seems to be more concise and um, more understandable for, the, for whoever the target audience is. So that's uh, something else that I've noticed. Uh, and then there's also creating safe space within union environment as you participate in activities and, um, and as you, I don't know, do social justice work by way of the union always, almost always for the community at large in some way, which many people don't actually make that connection, but I obviously did. So um, what I've found with that is leadership of unions is looking very, very different. It's looking um, more inclusive. I mean, Jason, looking more inclusive. And, and Jan, Jan Simpson of the postal workers. So that's, that's something that we didn't have that wasn't there five years ago, even 10 years ago. So that's a big stride. And with that comes more understanding of the needs of more diverse workers. And with, and we all, there's also a trend to hire um, staff that are more representative of the membership and of the membership's needs. And I'm just finding that um, with some of those changes, they, I don't know, they appear to be superficial, but really it's a change in the philosophy. It's a change in the way that the members are perceiving who can and is able to lead them. And they're, they're seeing that their success can look very different. So with that, I find that uh, workers are becoming more engaged. They're participating more. They're not as afraid to participate politically and to write their political leaders and to go to rallies and stuff. And that's, that's something that would not have happened because um, culturally and politically, many workers, and it, it, it doesn't matter if you're an African Nova Scotian worker or you're not, many workers are afraid to do that political action. And that all leads to um, when, when the worker is um, with their union, participating and being active, then it gives their union more resources to negotiate better, stronger collective agreements. And when you have a better, stronger collective agreement, you have a stronger union. And when your union is strong, you ultimately have more rights as a human being, more rights as a worker, more money in your pocket. You're better able to care for yourself so you can care for your family. And that's just a few of the things that I've noticed over the years and I thought I'd share them with you this evening. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rocky. Wow, I, I heard you word, use words uh, to describe um, black workers and their unions, words like communication, engagement, social justice, representation, leadership, and creating safe spaces. And it's really, really interesting to hear that, that you've observed a change, particularly over the last 15 years, and that it, it seems like your message is that Black workers are finding their place in the union of today. And that's a really wonderful message to share. Thank you so much for bringing that to us. And I know the questions are starting to pop up in chat, but we'll hear from our last speaker and then we'll turn it over and, and uh, present some of these questions to you and hear what you have to say. So our final, final panelist this evening is Jason McLean. Jason is the secretary treasurer of the National Union of Public and General Employees. 
Jason was elected to two terms in May 2016 and 2019 as president of, Nova, of the Nova Scotia Government and General Employees Union, which is Nova Scotia's largest public sector union. In the spring of 2022, he advanced to the position of secretary treasurer of the National Union of Public and General Employees. Born and raised in the community of Whitney Pier, Cape Breton, Jason grew up understanding the importance of diversity, fairness, and equality. When he is not advancing and advocating on behalf of the members, of his members, he is working, uh, he's enjoying spending time with his family. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much, Pauline, and uh, thank you to to the Federation of Labor and Topshi uh, for having me here. And uh, thank you, Russell and Rocky, for sharing as well, because uh, it's truly an honor to be on a panel with you two. Um, Rocky, who I've known a long, long time, and Russell, who I've been in your building, both physically and uh, on, on a placard there with uh, Black correctional officers that are on display. Uh, so I, I really just want to talk about the um, the past six years as being president of NSGU and then moving into uh, moving into the National Union of Public and General Employees uh, in a leadership role. But I also uh, want to utilize uh, examples of uh, my work life. And uh, so one thing that I've learned uh, with uh, barriers for African Nova Scotians uh, for employment is there is no concerted effort put forward by a lot of employers within our province. Uh, I've had a lot of time to do one-to-one uh, -one conversations with employers. Uh, through NSGU, we uh, developed uh, a cultural impact uh, conference that we did with employers, and uh, a lot did show up, but uh, I'm interested to see how many have been implementing new policy within their workplace. And uh, I'll use one example as well. Uh, I have a friend of mine that works for the Cape Breton Regional Police, uh, been there for many, many years. And uh, that police force does talk about uh, working to better the community and reflect the community. However, for the past uh, 30 years, there's only been four Black people, African Nova Scotians, working for the department. And so I say, yes, uh, lip service is put forward, all the right things are said, but you're not hiring people, it's not reflected in who you see. And uh, we also see that in um, Nova Scotia Health and other employers that are large employers to where uh, you see a lot of people uh, of diverse backgrounds working, uh, working there, but they're not working in the uh, top level management positions. And uh, that is a problem that we tried to work on with the provincial government along with uh, Nova Scotia Health and the IWK and others. Um, so for myself, uh, I originally uh, came out of corrections. So I worked in uh, at Cape Breton Correctional Facility, but uh, I got my training simply because the government had an initiative to go into the communities and to engage the communities for people uh, to actually look at a career in corrections. That was quite successful. Uh, the year I took uh, the program back, let's say back in the 90s, I'll just, uh, you can look at my beard and realize uh, that it's been a while. Uh, so back in the 90s, um, myself and other people were engaged in communities and we ended up uh, going to NSCC, uh, taking a corrections program and working in corrections. And there was a huge uptick uh, at that point of uh, African Nova Scotians working in corrections. Um, but getting hired wasn't just it. And uh, I often say uh, being a worker in Nova Scotia or being an African Nova Scotian worker in Nova Scotia, uh, you're, you're, you both get a blessing and a burden. And what that is, is a lot of times you're a one of, or you're one of the few that are working. And it's a, it, it, the burden or the blessing comes on you to teach your fellow co-workers about your culture, about your history, uh, and fill in the blanks for them because uh, employers truly weren't making the leap or going forward to, uh, to have many people of diverse uh, 
cultures working in workplaces. So when you're the one of, you're always talking about uh, what is what, and not only that, correcting people when they have, you know, racist behaviors and, and things of that nature. So I uh, I went into a hostile environment that I didn't know was a hostile environment. And uh, ultimately, it was the union that stepped up for me. And uh, I want to give back and I got I got involved. But also, the union as a, a broader piece was part of the problem as well. And uh, part of the problem being uh, there was no proactive uh, initiatives in place. And uh, so I tell you all of that story because uh, for me becoming a leader and to have a place of influence within the union, what I want to do was to uh, work with others, like-minded people, and really try to get to uh, implement some change into the union. And uh, in effect, uh, my vision with our national union is to be involved with our other components that are across this country. Uh, some are much more advanced than others in terms of uh, race relations and putting things uh, together, but that's what we do. We lean on each other to be able to use uh, the information, what worked right for our component in Ontario, wh what didn't work right for our components that are in BC and so on and so forth, and we can uh, share that information. So. Um, the whole presentation isn't about uh, negativity and how bad it was working. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel and we're working through it now. And uh, Rocky alluded to a few things that we were doing. So the first thing that uh, a group, be it an employer, be it a, a, a union must do is stop pretending that we're perfect. Stop pretending that we are anti-racist when absolutely we were not based on the policies we have provisions and collective agreements and stuff like that um in and rocky talked about changing the language one of the things we stopped talking about is things being grandfathered in a collective agreement and start using the language of legacy because we know of the the racist connotation that's uh the the origin of grandfathered and it was about uh it was about laws being put forward in the South for Black people not to be able to own land, but poor white people could own land if their grandfathers uh, originally lived in the country and owned land at one, one point. So it's uh, changing that language, coming back, looking within ourselves and talking to our members. Uh, currently right now, NSGU, through a resolution that went through convention, is uh, implementing cultural gatherings uh, within the union. Also, uh, they added voices at the table by creating an equity seat. Uh, my national union is the only national union that uh, actually polled our board members to see what, to have people self-identify, to see who was at the table so we can actively go out there and get those voices that weren't represented at the table at the table. And we have that currently in place right now. And also, um, NSGU and other components of the National Union are, are actually in the midst of conducting uh, equity audits within their own organization, which will bring out answers and will bring out uh, more questions, but it will definitely point them in the right direction where they need to go because uh, they will hear from our members uh, where they've been not or where they've been dropping the ball and not necessarily representing in the proper manner. And uh, that's what we need to do. And then uh, the last point that we need to do is still get proactive in bargaining. Uh, and once we're able to do the equity audits, once we're able to fully listen to all the voices that are there to start getting that language implemented in there. Uh, one thing that I was proud of working on was uh, how to, how to, or was to convince employers that the, the collective agreement isn't a barrier for them to do proactive things when it comes to uh, race within our, our membership uh, and stop using that as one because I'm here to talk about it and we can also deal with issues um, outside of the collective agreement and have them implemented either prior to if we both agree to open it up or implement it uh, during the bargaining process. So stop using it as a barrier and let's work together on it. And um, so thank you very much for having me to, to say all that. I don't want to take up all the time. So there's time for some questions and uh, thank you very much. Pauline. Thanks, Jason. Uh, I really appreciated hearing your words uh, speaking about the challenges that Black people still face in acquiring employment in this province, particularly at the higher levels. 
Uh, it also resonated when you talked about being one of the few and how the one of the few often has to assume the role of educator when really it's not your responsibility. It's, it's all of our responsibilities to learn um, an accurate history of Black people in our province, of people of African descent, and for us to, to all share in that responsibility and, and rise to take that challenge. Um, hearing you speak about the importance of unions, looking at what is happening elsewhere in the country with other unions in terms of race relations, um, being vulnerable, admitting imperfection, and, and embracing and being open to the learning that can come from that. It really struck home when you said, uh, essentially words matter, um, sharing the, the example of, of the, the term grandfathered and how legacy is really a far more appropriate term today. And the importance of cultural gatherings as long, along with representation, equity audits, and the importance of making sure that the words matter in the collective agreements that are, that are negotiated and that equity is present in the collective agreements that are negotiated to really help what Rocky was saying in terms of improving people's work life and quality of life improves their home life. It, it improves their lives as citizens in our, in our communities, in our province, in our country. So thanks so much uh, to all three of you. You have shared a richness of experience and knowledge. And I know that there are questions that are coming up in the chat already. And I'm just gonna scroll back here and see what the first one is. Uh, there's a comment from, I hope I'm saying your name close to correctly, but Zainab Mansare. And Zainab says, wow, what a wonderful presentation. This is after your, your sharing, Russell. Thank you. I'm emotionally crying now, thinking of my ancestors' history in Nova Scotia. My name is Zainab Mansare, born and raised in Sierra Leone. And through this history of the Black Loyalist, I founded the organization called Canada Sierra Leone Friendship Society. So really important and, and clearly what you shared resonated. And I think there's a question uh, comes up a little bit later. A question for you, Rocky, about are there policies within collective agreements to ensure newcomers have an opportunity to learn about the history of African Nova Scotians in this province who have a unique place here, historically speaking? So are there policies within collective agreements to ensure newcomers have the opportunity to engage in this learning? I can't speak for all collective agreements, but my collective agreement with the province of Nova Scotia, I do not believe there is. And that's not something that I've ever heard of having a, a policy or a clause of that kind there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So maybe that's a little bit of the work that remains and, and something that yeah. we need to take a closer look at. Great, thank you. Uh, Celeste Cotel has offered a resource, uh, noting that Impact Organizations of Nova Scotia has a great online program. It was very informative. And in, in the link, it's talking about Black History Learning Journey. So that might be something that could be uh, shared with others. Um, Elizabeth Cook has a question for Jason. A short answer on how do you see an appropriate evaluation for employers to be developed which could move towards equity, diversity, and inclusionary policies. Thank you for thank you for that question. Um, you obviously don't know me because I never give a short answer. <laughs> 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 uh, no, I, I'm actually joking. But um, what I want to, I think employers sometimes can fall into a, a cultural rut is what I'll call it, right? Because uh, workplaces, as far as I'm concerned, uh, develop a culture that transcends everybody. Because uh, you could have, uh, you know, diverse people that all act uh, a certain way as it pertains to work, and then start to have a, a similar vision as well when it as it pertains to work. Uh, outside of work could be a different story or whatever. But um, what I find is what you need to do is look around, and you need to you need to look at one. Do do you have policies on uh, employment uh, equity and diversity? Uh, employment diversity, or sorry, 
equity, diversity, and inclusion. If you don't have a policy on that, then you really, you know, you're at the bottom rung there and you really need to, to uh, pick things up. If you do have one, are you practicing what's within it? And is your, it, over the history of your organization, has it become more inclusive? Meaning, do you see different faces around the table? And is your management team, are they diverse as well? It, it's more of looking within the organization, looking at it. Um, and then asking those questions, having those hard conversations because they're they're not easy. People get offended pretty quick when they when they uh, feel that they're put on the hot seat that they're quite possibly uh, uh, a racist organization. And I don't and and I say that uh, really to uh, to get people's attention because if you're not being anti-racist, you're racist. And uh, people really need to get that message. So it's about being proactive. It's about working to it. And if that's not happening in your organization, then you know that that, that they failed the evaluation and work needs to be done. So passive complacency just doesn't cut it. No. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, Russell, we have a question here for you. Uh, if there is information and resources that could be donated to the Black Cultural Center, how would one go about doing that? Uh, you can simply visit our website and um, <clears throat> contact us. I'll put the website address in the uh, the chat as well as our email address. Uh, you know, probably about uh, eighty percent of our content that we have in the Black Cultural Center comes from community. Comes from community bringing items forward, uh, and then we go through an extensive research process to support that. Uh, one of the areas right now that we're actually starting to gather. Uh, some content on is actually um, Black history in the labor movement. You know, when we think of, of Nova Scotia trailblazers like the late Rocky Jones, we think of Lynn Jones, uh, uh, his, uh, his, his uh, you know, family member, uh, and the contributions of, of others that have made such remarkable aspects. And then you look fast forward to today with people like our very own, you know, Jason that's here with us tonight um, that have made you know, tremendous contributions and, and have gone through uh, a lot of struggle and adversity to create that leadership. That's what, uh, you know, the Cultural Center is, is all about and our museum collection is all about. And I think, you know, the sediment that we, we're hearing here and the theme that we're hearing is, is that, you know, we can start to chisel away at racism and racist views and racist attitudes and racial bias by learning more about each other. And, you know, places like the Black Cultural Center and other organizations that share information, I uh, can create those opportunities. Great, thanks, Russell. We have a question uh, from from Zainab Mansouri uh, that asks: With this wonderful wonderful historical stories about the Black communities in Canada, how can the Canadian government implement strong information policy of racism in their system? So how can the Canadian government implement strong information policy of racism in their system? Russell, do you want to start? Sure, yeah, I, I think it's all about creating a greater understanding. I think that uh, providing learning opportunities, providing opportunities in which we can uh, gather and have those difficult conversations, those can lead to that type of high level policy change that has to happen, that high level um, you know, um, educational changes that, that need to exist. Because when you look at black culture or you know, for that uh, you know, uh, matter, any marginalized communities, culture and heritage, it's always hidden. It's always not top of mind. And when we, we get to a place where we can stop looking at various cultures, history and, and their heritage in silos and look at it as just Canada's history as our shared history, I think that's gonna make a change. And I think that organizations like unions, businesses and, and you know, uh, government institutions have a duty, have a duty to reflect what society is. And you know, uh, it, was, it was said, which was very well said by, uh, by Jason and Rocky that you know, there is racism, it exists. It exists in our organizations because it exists in society. 
So if we can cure it in society, we'll cure it in our organizations. And I mean, that's basically where it has to come from. And uh, it's all about having the, that safe space to be able to have those discussions and create a, a you know, greater understanding. Great, thank you, Russell. Rocky or Jason, would, would either of you like to add to that? Um, I could jump in there. Uh, I just believe, I, I, I agree with everything Russell said. Uh, philosophically, I look at uh, government as the leaders, right? They, they set the trend. And, uh, and so you need the federal government uh, to do it and get the, the provincial government involved and everything else. The problem with that is if, if there's no will to do it, uh, or sorry, if there's less will to do it than there needs to be, you, you tend to get into jurisdictional problems where uh, provinces will say, well, we have provinces' rights and, and we can do this and do that. And uh, and then the, the federal government's hands are tied. But uh, the pressures that I try to put on MPs when I talk to them is in, in MLAs as well, is you you act you absolutely have to follow the lead of the other government. But but I say all that in hopes that like we we've achieved Emancipation Day. Uh, Senator Dr. Wadner Thomas Bernard uh, put a lot of work in that, and uh, I I not I tip my hat to her for for the work that uh, she did on that and getting it there. What I want to see is government come the full way and start talking about reparations with with. Uh, with black people across this country uh, as a real admission to there was slavery in this country. There was promises made to people to come and, and be with the British and fight with the British. And uh, we got we need go any further than the uh, than the uh, Black Loyalist Center in uh, outside of Shelburne to really have your eyes opened on how many people were promised land, didn't get land and stuff like that. So we see it here. It also happened uh, in other parts of the country as well. And uh, that conversation needs to happen. And once that does, and a, and a government comes through with that with conviction, then we're well on our way to not ignoring things that have happened in the past, uh, actually acknowledging them and then moving on into the future. So, uh, so I, I, I probably added a little bit more to that, but that that's how I see it really uh, developing uh, well for the country. Thank you, Jason. Rocky? Yeah, yeah I just have, um, I, I'm in agreement with um, all the comments on this question, but something else we have to keep in mind. We live in a, in a democracy and we are the voting constituent. We have some control over who represents us. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be represented by people who have, who, who believe the same and who have the same values as you, you have to get those people to run for office and you have to elect them. Thank you. Well said, Rocky, thank you. Another question in our chat comes from Anthony Scoggins and he prefaces it with saying, this is an awkward question, question to Jason. Many Canadians would argue that our policing, corrections, and justice systems themselves contain inherently racist elements. So is it a struggle for Black employees working within those systems try to reconcile their own engagements? Uh, Anthony, I love this question. Awkward for some. That's not awkward for me. My, my simple answer to that is I certainly hope that they struggle with it because I struggled with it working there and uh and i i had to take things head on uh when i seen it happening for my i'll give you examples so i seen it happening uh with myself where uh, i was being treated differently than others and uh, i had to speak up uh ultimately we ended up with a zero tolerance policy where inmates couldn't call me the n-word and and say racist things to me and not only that staff had to back me up on it when uh when when stuff like that was happening. Uh, some staff were saying, well, you're just supposed to take that. But then somebody would call Rocky out of her name and uh, everybody's marching down to take that person in isolation and uh, and uh, put that person in, in some sort of punishment. So uh, I seen it there. Uh, I also seen it that uh, when I was around, I was hearing uh, uh, from time to time, I would hear uh, jokes about uh, First Nations people uh and 
I'm saying, and I take people on, they're like, why do you care about this? I'm saying, I care about it because one, it's wrong, but two, what are you saying when I'm not around? It's all of a sudden, it's not, it's a black person in that joke. You know, it's not an indigenous person. I said, I know how it goes. And uh, you think I'm going to be comfortable with that and laugh with you when that's a joke and and, and go on. And then uh, another one was uh, when people would come in, um, uh, there was a tendency to house all Muslim people together, a tendency to house all black people together, tendency to house all the um, First Nations people together and stuff like that. And uh, my fight against that was how are people going to learn about other people's cultures if you're just going to segregate people while they're in the jail? So uh, so uh, there was a lot of work that was done with that. I, I speak about my experience from corrections, Anthony, and I just feel it's very important that uh, if somebody is not uncomfortable with the way it is in their workplace right now, then they should be worried because I know it's not perfect and you, you have to be vigilant and you have to push back all the time. Thank you, Jason. And uh, Larry made a comment in chat, uh, applauding uh, your previous response, saying thanks for that. Um, if you or your organization are not anti-racist, then you are racist. And that really gives us something to think about. If we're not actively engaging in anti-Black racist uh, work, then, then what are we doing? Yeah, yeah. So this, this evening is also about celebrating uh, um, the contributions of, of Black Nova Scotians and people of African descent living in Nova Scotia. And we've certainly heard elements of that from each of you. But I wonder, uh, just taking perhaps one minute each, is there is there a person or a, 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 an event or something that has occurred in the province that really stands out for you as something that's made significant change or led to significant positive change uh, for Black workers in, in the province that you'd like to share? Russell, can I go back to you to start? Sure. Yeah, I think for me, um, an eye-opener over the last uh, two years that I've been involved in was a project uh, to see the Government of Canada provide a national apology to the members and descendants of Number 2 Construction Battalion, which was a segregated unit that was in uh, served in the First World War. And the fact that these brave men had to fight for the right to serve their country you know, when you look at the history and the longstanding history of Blacks in this province, in Canada, those men, when the, the First World War broke out in, in 1916, they um, were, uh, you know, in Canada, had a presence in Nova Scotia well over 100 years. They were just as much Canadian as everyone else. And they were told no, you know, because of the color of their skin, because of anti-Black racism. And that remarkable story that, you know, now uh, 106 years later, the government says they're sorry for this. Um, it's more than just the words, I'm sorry. It's the acknowledgement that these brave men were a part of Canada's society at that time, and that they were doing what they felt was the right thing to serve their king and country at the time. And so when you look at that, that is a remarkable story of um, adversity uh, and being able, able to come overcome that adversity and to do something remarkable. When you look at the legacy that they left behind in their service and their service of labor, I might add, you know that it was a labor battalion. It was not a battalion that that you know could bear arms. And the mm -hmm. fact that they were able to do that says you know the type of depth uh, that, uh, and the type of people these men were. So. That's a story that really touches me and a story that I think we should celebrate. A remarkable story indeed. Thank you so much, Russell, for, for raising that and, and bringing it back to our consciousness this evening. Wonderful, thank you. Rocky, is there is there an example you'd like to share? There is, and it's um, something that's a little more close to my, um, to my family and my heart. And that was when I uh, went out and bought Shantae Grant's book, Up Home. It's a children's storybook, not very fancy or anything, but it's written about um, where my, my people are from, North Preston. It has uh, people in it that I know and speak to and, 
and their likeness is there and 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 Fanny's field is there where I went as a child so to see my home and my people reflected in a book that any person in the world can buy and pick up and learn about and and to know that it was written by a family member that I mean I just found that very inspiring so that that's that's what it is for me and and now as a an interactive aunt I I kind of see to it that the young ones all read the book mm -hmm. so yeah fabulous Fabulous example. Thank you so much for sharing, Rocky. And Jason. Pauline, I have to ask you to answer uh, to ask the question again. Just I'm wondering if there as we as we not only talk about the issues that still face black workers in Nova Scotia, but uh, keeping in mind that we want to celebrate the contributions and the legacy of, of black workers in this province, uh, or even more generally, is there an example of something that comes to mind for you? that really shows positive um, sustaining change? Yes, well, it, it's, I have to say it's been um, through, I'll say the legacy uh, areas uh, that I've known, uh, like years ago uh, in my community and others, there was uh, what we call CUBE, Community United for Black Educators right, and, uh, or Black education. And um, we also had the Black Cultural Center, right? We have African Nova Scotian affairs, uh, more recently, I would say, because I'm old. Uh, but there was always places to where um, I could try and find myself, or I could try and, and find resources for myself and for my family. And uh, today, it's more readily available than ever. Uh, and so that is something that I take notice of. And, and you know, again, I, I nod my head to you, Russell, for what you're doing, because what you're doing is, is fantastic. Uh, and it is a place that we can see. Uh, and we're starting to, as Rocky was saying, we're starting to see more uh, African Nova Scotians, more Black people in leadership roles, in organizations and stuff like that. And that's what we need as well. And to be able to get into the communities, that's the part that I think isn't being bridged in the actual work needs to do. But uh, I I just like the, uh, the organizations that have been there and uh, are still there doing the work and uh, are a resource for people. And that just, that's, that can't be forgotten. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jason, for, for bringing that up. And, and as you're speaking, people are adding resources in chat uh, that they're saying are really good. Uh, Tammy Cox Jardine just mentioned that she read um, up home to her grade three class today. So lots of resonance with folks who are who are listening in this evening. Are, yes, Danny? Uh, if I just might add something, I just want to recognize Larry Russo who is an officer at the Canadian Labour Congress, who's joined the webinar tonight. I don't know the logistics of allowing them to be seen on the screen or not as possible, but but I think it's important. Uh, Larry's also a worker of color. Uh, he has a leadership position at the, at the Canadian Labour Congress, and I just wanted to recognize his participation with us tonight. Thanks, Larry, for joining us. Oh, thanks so much, Danny, for catching that. And I apologize, Larry. I, I I just saw the first name. I didn't see the last and didn't realize it was you who had joined us this evening. Uh, yeah, like Danny said, thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you with us. And just as we close this evening, I just want to say thank you so, so much for all of our panelists this evening. That has This has been incredibly inspiring, thoughtful, thought-provoking, and uh, I think we're all leaving this evening's web webinar feeling rather full and, and appreciative of all, of all that we've heard. I'd like to thank all of you, the audience, who've joined us this evening as well, and uh, look forward to having you with us for future webinars. And before we, before we sign off completely, 
I would just like to say that this has been a wonderful opportunity to celebrate African Heritage Month in Nova Scotia and to honor the legacy and contributions of Black workers in our province, while also discussing issues that people continue to face. So very important. Some thanks are also due, and I'd certainly like to mention Joan Wark from the Nova Scotia Federation of Labor, uh, Brian Lazuri, Jenny McDonald, and Susan Hawks from the Cody Institute, who provide fantastic communication support. And again, I'd like to acknowledge the Topshi Memorial Fund's sponsorship of this event. I would ask you to please keep your eye open for our next webinar in this series, which will take place from 7 to 8 p.m. on Thursday, March 23rd, and it will focus on International Women's Day and the connection of women in, in our workplaces and with labor and our social movements uh, today. Uh, Danny, is there any, are there any final words you'd like to share before we close out for this evening? No, thanks, Pauline. And again, thanks to you and our panelists. I think it was a, a really great discussion. I know I've, I've, learned, I've learned quite a bit tonight and I still have lots to learn. And um, I really appreciate everybody's participation and, and thoughts that they've had tonight. And it's really interesting, I think, the long history uh, that uh, Black people have within Nova Scotia. Uh, I think we all need to we all need to try to capture that in our own minds and start and take in places like the cultural center and uh, and some of the work that Russell's doing and um, you know so those are all places we can take advantage of to educate ourselves and we need to do that as Nova Scotians. So thanks again. Great, thank you, Danny. And again, thank you to our panelists this evening. I'll ask you maybe just to stay on the line as others leave. And finally, a big thank you to all of you for joining us this evening to honor Black workers in Nova Scotia. I'm Pauline McIntosh, and I wish you all a very good night.